The intensive schedule of the three-day Belt and Road Forum left many participants seeking relaxations afterwards. For busy journalists like me, the stress of covering such an event was expected. So where do I go to ease the stress? If you need to unwind, what could be more soothing than nature? Right after the Belt and Road Forum comes Beijing's International Horticulture Exhibition. According to a 2017 study, exposure to nature, such as taking a walk in the garden, has positive health effects, such as lowering depression and anxiety. But of course, the significance of the Horticulture Expo goes well beyond that. President Xi Jinping announced during his keynote speech at the Belt and Road Forum that leaders will establish a Belt and Road International Alliance on Green Development. It will be an information sharing and green technology transfer platform for member countries. We will continue with an open, green and corruption-free development philosophy, pushing forward green infrastructure, green investment, green finance. We will protect our common home. And with President Xi welcoming nearly 900 delegates to the expo, including world leaders, foreign envoys and horticulture experts, the message from the forum has clearly carried over. Yue Zhezhou is now leading century forever, a pharmaceutical company based in southwest China. In the past one and a half years, Yue has been helping over 90 new biomedical products developed by Sichuan University's West China Hospital reach the market. The hospital is often ranked top in terms of research and development. Century Forever aims to land its technology commercialization arm on the new science and technology innovation board next year after their products enter the second phase of clinical trials, a prerequisite for an IPO. Many young technology firms can hardly accumulate profit, but they have great growth potential. Technology innovation needs research and development, which requires lots of money. The new board can certainly help these high-tech firms. Despite China's existing main boards, the Science and Technology Innovation Board does not only accept profitable companies. One clinical breakthrough plus a market cap of at least four billion US dollars is enough for a pharma company to apply. Companies like Century Forever spend tens of millions of dollars every quarter for just one new drug. Once the drug successfully hits the market, it can easily bring back billions. But due to the nature of biomedicine, it could take up to over 10 years for clinical trials before any of them can be put up for sale. A steady stream of financial support is, therefore, essential. Biomedicine has a relatively longer investment cycle, high risks and high yields. Private capital primarily focuses on quick returns, which can hardly support the full cycle for biomedicine's development. Investment need to follow necessary capital market regulations before they can be injected into farmer firms. That's where the Science and Technology Innovation Board can play an important role, especially for biomedicine startups. Security experts believe the new board can also offer more assistance to tech firms from China's landlocked region, such as Chengdu, the capital city of China's southwest Sichuan province. Chengdu has been rolling out preferential policies to attract talented people and tech firms in recent years. There's a lot of room for future development, but in short term, these firms are still relatively weak in marketing their products compared to companies from the coastal area. With help from the capital market, an IPO on the Science and Technology Innovation Board could accelerate growth. The future has won and the past has lost. A relief for Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez as his party secured its place in Congress, winning a total of 123 seats in the snap elections. Sunday's results show the left-wing Socialist Workers' Party has won 38 more seats than in the last election, almost twice the number of its rival, right-wing Popular Party.
The latter continued to lose support due to a series of corruption charges, but is far from satisfying. The PSOE still falls short of the 176 threshold to form a majority government, and the leader of the third largest party, Ciudadanos, has earlier ruled out a coalition with the winner. Prime Minister Sanchez now relies on the 42 seats of its ally, Podemos Party, and other independent parties who share altogether 39 seats. Another significant and not unexpected result is the rise of the far-right Vox Party, a political new star gaining supporters by new media. It has got 24 seats, slightly below expectations, but it's still the first far-right grouping to win more than a single seat in Congress since 1975. Well, it's a, it's a relatively new party. It's only been around for really for four years. And essentially it was a fringe party until it suddenly exploded onto the scene four months ago in the regional elections in the region of Andalusia and it attained 12% of the vote. Since then it really has been at the centre of a lot of media attention because it is a very hard right party. It's got a strong angle against Catalan independence. It's got a strong angle against feminism. It's against immigration. And it is, I think, it's very important, to, and as you mentioned in your report as well, to situate it as part of the, uh, the emergence of these right-wing populist parties that are happening across Europe and in other countries in the world. Five major political parties competing. This is something Spanish voters haven't seen in decades an indication of the country's deepening fragmentation and the formation of a political coalition is still hanging in the air. Taking heat from the sun to produce electricity seems like a dream solution, but solar panels take up vast areas of land, which has been a major disadvantage. Now a new approach is being pioneered, citing them on water. Engineers say it saves valuable space, and the water's cooling effect makes solar cells more efficient and longer lasting. These two factors convinced Thailand State Electricity Authority to draw up ambitious plans to construct 16 floating solar farms at nine hydropower reservoirs, making a major contribution to future power needs. Research is taking place at this test bed at Rayong, 170 kilometers from the capital, Bangkok. Thailand, we have a strong commitment for the CO2 issue and putting more renewable energy in Thailand is a government policy. To put solar, big massive solar farm on the for Thailand for agricultural industry doesn't make sense. And by having a lot of standing water like the reservoir that it can manage. I think it's a win-win situation. The designers say constructing solar farms at existing hydro schemes will double electricity production. When conditions limit solar generation, hydropower can take over. Thailand currently produces around 12% of its energy from renewable sources. But it plans to increase that to 37%, more than a third of total capacity within 20 years and floating solar will make a significant contribution. Thailand will begin by building a 63 million US dollar solar farm at the Sirindorn Dam in Ubon Ratchatani. The full network is scheduled to be constructed over the next two decades. Eight of the planned solar farms will each be bigger than the world's current largest at a collapsed coal mine in China. Meanwhile, the island state of Singapore, where land is extremely limited, is developing a floating solar system in the sea off its coast. Elsewhere in Asia, China, India, Japan and South Korea are among those pursuing floating solar technology.